Are you tired of your valuable ideas and suggestions getting lost in the shuffle? Well, that is why I'm introducing Direct Suggest, the revolutionary digital suggestion box that puts your voice front and center. With Direct Suggest, you have the power to make a difference in your organization. Direct Suggest provides value to organizations in various industries worldwide, including notable brands like Comcast, TD Bank, and Nokia. And here's the best part. Direct Suggest only costs 50 cents per employee per month, making it an affordable solution for businesses of all sizes. Plus, they have an incredibly high ROI and savings potential with an average 33 times return on investment. The implementation process is also a breeze. Once committed, setting up Direct Suggest from start to finish can be completed in as quickly as a week or less. Don't let your ideas or your team's ideas go unnoticed. Visit directsuggest.com today and start by making a difference with Direct Suggest. Use the promo code HUMANHR for your extended 60-day free trial. Again, visit directsuggest.com to learn more and remember to use promo code HUMANHR for an extended free trial. Direct Suggest, where your voice matters. Welcome to the Bringing the Human Back to Human Resources podcast. I'm Tracy Chernoff, and I've spent my entire professional career in HR. Each week, we'll explore the delicate balance between people and business with the aim to reconnect the two and create meaningful outcomes. Listen in as I share my own experiences, challenge the status quo, and chat with guests from various industries about our mission to bring the human back to human resources. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here for another week. This week, I have a guest, Rita Sorenin, on the podcast, and you want to talk about bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience. That is what we are going to dive into today. So let me tell you a little bit about Rita. For more than 30 years, she has worked on behalf of abused, neglected, and vulnerable children, providing leadership for local, state, and national efforts, working to improve the juvenile justice and child welfare systems while striving to assure safe and permanent homes for North America's children. Leading the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, a national nonprofit public charity since 2001, and the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption Canada since 2003, Rita has worked to find permanent families for the more than 140,000 waiting children in North America's foster care systems. Under her leadership, the foundation has significantly increased its grant making while developing strategic initiatives that act on the urgency of the issue. Rita is also a member of the Forbes Nonprofit Council and currently resides in Columbus, Ohio. Rita, you are bringing decades of experience and <laughs> quite the cause uh, that you're in, in terms of the experience of what you do. It's really quite the cause. So thank you so much for being uh, joining the podcast and for being here today. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. And you're very kind. That's just a nice way of saying I'm getting really old. <laughs> no, no. You know, this is, I I am always happy to say that that in business and it, just in the workplace in general, experience is such a wonderful thing. And, you know, I I look forward to the day when I can say I have 30 years of experience. So I'm, <laughs> I'm impressed nonetheless. And I'm sure it's a very difficult uh, career or, or job to do because you're seeing so much I don't know if devastation is the right word, but I'm sure it can be pretty heavy. Yeah, you know, at times we see the best and the worst of what can happen in what should be the safest of place for children within their families, within their community. So it is something that drives us here at the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption Every Day. How do we assure that safety and how do we assure a kind of permanent home so that that child, every child, has the right, who has that right to grow up safe and can thrive then as adults in their community. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's uh, such a, again, a, a wonderful cause. And I, I think, you know, every child has the, should, has, deserves the opportunity to be, grow up in a safe environment. Um, but to just be able to have organizations that focus on their welfare and their well being is a, a wonderful thing. And for the listeners, they might be thinking, well, how is all of this, as much as we care about it, how is all of this relevant to the typical topics that we find on the Bringing the Human Back to Human Resources podcast? Because, of course, mo- most of the episodes are focused on, you know, workplace trends and business and, you know, HR stuff. But we, ha- we are bringing a unique topic to the forefront today, which is really about adoption benefits, foster care benefits, things like that, that people, depending on the organization that they're in, either do or do not have access to. And I think when you and I first connected um, many moons ago at this point, 
we kind of spoke about how there are organizations that really lack in the um, equitable approach to what family benefits look like and how people can um, just have a family outside of work if they're not, you know, choosing to have like a a natural birthing process or whatever that might be. I don't know really the correct terminology to use in comparison to adoption or foster care, but um, I'm really interested to just kind of pivot to you and hear just generally speaking what your thoughts are on on business offerings, or I should say benefit offerings for businesses in this space. Well, and and it's that unique link between your expertise and this podcast and the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, because one of our signature programs is encouraging employers to provide benefits, adoption benefits to families in their workplace who step forward to adopt, whether it's foster care adoption, international adoption, domestic infant adoption. Our focus at the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption is foster care adoption. But this notion that, um, you know, employers offer benefits to families that are formed through birth. And and we all take that for granted and it should be there. The difference here is that it's a medical process typically. And so we want to support a mother that has to go through all of the medical processes. And then the family, um, a growing number of, and that recognition in a growing number of places that it's not just about the mother that gives birth, it's about the family experience. And so whatever that family looks like, that family should be afforded paid leave, time off, time to bond, time to, to heal, all of those things that go along with maternity and birth. And, and we realized a number of years ago through our founder, Dave Thomas, um, who started this program very serendipitously, um, he, he was adopted. And he started the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption in 1992 to focus exclusively on foster care adoption. But one of the first things that he did, even before he created the foundation, was begin to talk to other CEOs and say, hey, you know, I've, I've got this dilemma. Um, our, our company offers um, uh, benefits to families that are formed through birth. My emphasis here now is looking at adoption. And so we've created adoption benefits in our workplace do you? And so he began just this informal conversation and began to drive this notion that it is an equitable thing to do. It creates loyalty. It creates a sense of family-friendly environment, and it provides the same kind of supports that families that are formed through birth uh, already have, and that's time to bond, um, you know, sometimes a little bit of flexible scheduling, um, financial reimbursement for the costs. And so we've taken that, what was just a great idea from Dave Thomas, and turned it into a signature program, and gather information from employers that fill out a survey about what are their adoption benefits, and then every every year create a hundred best adoption friendly workplace list um, that we publish and give recognition to employers so that we can continue to build this momentum that it's the right thing to do, that it's the natural thing to do, that it's just business as usual to not only provide benefits to families that are formed through birth, but benefits to families that are formed through adoption. That's really interesting. When I, and first of all, now I understand some of the terminology too. I like this, that families formed through birth versus families that are formed through adoption and fostering. Um, When I think about, you know, companies out there that are typically offering benefits like this, my immediate reaction or my instinct is to say that larger companies with maybe more resources are probably the first, hopefully the first, to offer these. Is that true? Are you seeing companies of all sizes offering these types of benefits? It is absolutely companies of all sizes, including small nonprofit organizations, large Fortune 500 companies, governmental entities. It really shouldn't matter. Um, Of course, budget drives those kinds of decisions. But what we know is then when it's offered, less than one-tenth of one percent of employees um, use those benefits. So it's it's Mm -hmm. cost-effective. And the return is based on the huge amount of of equity, sense of equity that that it creates in employees, that sense of fairness, that sense of loyalty, and that recognition from a company that families look a lot different, you know, among yeah. fam- from family to family to family. And so that recognition that adoption is woven into the fabric of American families. It's been quiet for a long time. It typically was associated, you know, decades and decades and decades ago. 
it was it was more associated with that secrecy of a, an unwed mother that suddenly you know went away for a few months mm -hmm. came back and no one ever talked about the fact she may have had a baby and so that sense of secrecy tends to still pervade in in the conversation of adoption and so this is one of those ways to open up the conversation to celebrate adoption and then for us particularly that conversation of foster care adoption has a lot of other kinds of myths and misperceptions that surround it. So it helps us to normalize that conversation as well. Absolutely. Your point on the, you know, really like one tenth of these benefits being utilized um, is actually a really good point. And, and I think when I think about any time I've proposed new benefits to a company, um, I, I tend to lean on that, that just because you offer a benefit doesn't mean that it's going to be used or taken advantage of by every single person. But the, the sense that is felt when you do offer certain benefits is so much greater than the cost. Like the, the ROI specifically is so much greater than the cost of offering those benefits. And it then made me think about um, some feedback that I've gotten from listeners, you know, in terms of like how they can promote different benefits at their organizations or try to get new benefits. And one of the more popular uh, or more spoken of benefits that I hear of is IVF treatment and that a lot of companies don't necessarily have IVF within their medical plans, um, nor, you know, and with that, nor is there, uh, you know, kind of like additional compensation if someone does need to um, go for fertility treatments or infertility treatments in the event that the medical coverage does not provide for IVF treatments. And it's interesting because companies that at least that from what I have read, um, tend to uh, be more responsive to benefits that are, you know, pushed and whether it's IVF, adoption, foster care, if it means something to them, or if it's relevant to them, maybe someone who has gone through infertility or has um, decided that they want to create a family through adoption. Like that's usually when we see leaders taking a stand for something. Yep. Um, and so all of this kind of ties back for me, uh, being a woman in business, thinking about the importance of representation of women in leadership, because yes. the, typically it is, and of course, I obviously am making some sweeping generalizations here, but I feel comfortable as a woman in business to say this, that in, in most cases, it's, it's those who are, um, focused on starting families, whether they're, you know, women or prospective mothers to try and push for these benefits, pu push these benefits, benefits forward, excuse me, in order to have some sort of um, enhanced experience at work. However, there are, of course, many men and other people who want the same, these same benefits for their own families as well. So it's not to say that they are not included, but, you know, I, I find at least it, it really, it, even outside of these benefits, when it comes to creating something new or offering something new, usually someone has to have like skin in the game or a stake in it in order to really care about it, whether right or wrong. Yeah. I just think that's probably factual. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're absolutely right. And there's a parallel here between the creation of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Look, Dave Thomas was the founder of the Wendy's company, of Square Hamburgers and Frosties, right? Um, mm. And so oh. people would think the natural creation of a foundation would, would he would do something with food insecurity, perhaps, mm. um, or something yeah. like that. But because he had that personal connection to adoption, that's what drove this creation right. and this this for-profit and not-for-profit alignment of cause with the Wendy's Company and the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. We're a wholly separate non-profit organization, but that what what on the face of it wouldn't appear to be the the first link between a fast food company and and a, a non-profit is there because of, of the founder's passion for it. And so it's exactly what you said. It takes that voice of representation sometimes, usually, to get something moving in a way that can make a big difference. Yeah. That's really interesting, this, you know, kind of how everything is full circle with the Dave Thomas Foundation. I had no idea that, uh, you know, the connection to Wendy's, it's super cool. Everyone loves a Frosty as far as I'm concerned. Um, but it's it's actually a really great example of how someone who is connected to an experience or has experienced something themselves or has been the beneficiary of something that was a benefit to a parent or a caregiver I mean, it really is a, an excellent point, an example of how that matters so much in terms of like the underlying force and passion in driving something. 
And exactly. I, I think a, a, just a, a natural next question then is how can, because I guess I'll preface by saying we shouldn't have to care or have like stake in something in order to offer better benefits. Like even, whether someone wants to have children or not, they, people, whether they're in HR or other business leaders, should be thinking about how can I offer the best, most equitable, best-in-class benefits to employees. So the, the next question that I have is how can we encourage others to really think beyond the scope of maybe what is a, a typical and understanding like uh, birthing-based families? How do we get those business leaders to see beyond that and to understand that benefits aren't offered because everyone's going to take advantage of them, but rather offered in the event that someone needs those benefits. Well, and we hear from the companies that we survey and that we interact with time and time again, it becomes a, a, a small but but an important recruiting tool so that if a em potential employee has the choice between two organizations, on everything else is fairly equal when they begin to dive into the benefit package and they see a family-friendly benefit package, whether it's IVF or adoption benefits or anything that's a little bit out of the ordinary, that's where they're going to begin to shift in terms of saying, this is the company that I want to associate with. So I think it becomes um, very much a, a, a subtle, if not overt, recruiting tool we also make it easy from the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. So if the concern is, look, we've got so much going on, matters of economy, matters of, of business, uh, you know, supply side issues, we've got too much going on to think about one more add to our HR package. We make it really easy. We've got toolkits, we've got templates, um, we've got a list of other employers that folks can connect with to say, how did you do this? Um, everything that an employer needs to implement something really very easy to implement, um, including how to talk to your budget manager and let them mm -hmm. know that this is gonna be okay. It's not gonna be a deep dive into your budget in order to make this happen. Um, we make that easy for employers. And so it's both as a recruiting tool and as an ease of implementation, it seems like a pretty easy sell. I love this. So what is, or is there like an average budget, let's say for a person who is uh, going to take advantage of adoption? Like is there, maybe the question is not about budget. Maybe it's a two part question actually. Is there a budget per employee who takes advantage of an adoption or fostering benefit for a company? And then the second part is what is the average cost in order for an individual or a family if they, <clears throat> excuse me, if they do decide to adopt or foster. Sure. And, and make no mistake, whatever an employer offers, unless you're one of these extraordinary businesses, some businesses offer unlimited kinds of wow. financial reimbursement. They're few and far between. Um, and they're of a size that they can afford to do that. Right. Sure. But for the majority, people can uh, it, 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 to adopt, for example, internationally, it can cost anywhere from thirty to forty thousand dollars to adopt, and that includes legal fees, transportation, lodging, um, the agency fees that someone has to pay. To adopt domestically an infant domestically, it hovers around the same thing, just depending. It's covering the cost of of mother's medical benefits, perhaps to the birth mother, or um, uh, again, attorney fees, all of the kinds of fees that get embedded in that. To adopt from foster care is relatively inexpensive, and that's not to diminish the value of these children. It's just that the state or the county covers all of those costs because they're in the custody of the state or the county. Right. And so that we say that's anywhere from one to $3,000. So the next part of your question, well, what's the average uh, benefit that's offered? And we know, again, from our survey, this is the average. Some are much less, some are much more. But the average financial reimbursement that a company offers is about $12,000. And the average paid leave over and above what's required by law, or, uh, required by law, whether it's paid or unpaid, is about eight weeks of paid leave. Um, and so some companies will offer additional unpaid leave, some will offer um, significantly less financial reimbursement, but again, at least it's there and, and acknowledges mm -hmm. that these families have needs. We also include in this foster care benefits. So even a family that steps forward to temporarily bring a child into their home, a child who's been abused or neglected, they become temporary parents, foster parents for that child. Things like paid leave, a flexibility of some paid leave time is really important to those families because they frequently have to go to court or, or take their child to an appointment or go back and forth with home visits, their, their, their um, uh, family of origin home visits. So it's this breadth and depth of 
potential offerings for families. And, and again, it typically doesn't cover for two kinds of adoption, the full cost, but it's a significant nod to what those families need. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the key to offering benefits is remembering that we don't have to give 100% in order for the benefit to be equitable or appreciated. Um, sometimes just offering something, whatever a business can do, is more than enough. For a company, like for the, those who um, have reached out to me about especially these IVF benefits or, um, you know, even even non-familial uh, focused benefits, even something like having a 401k match, you know, at the end of the day, if a business can only match 1%, it's better than nothing. And exactly. so my message to these individuals who have reached out is that we, you know, let's not try to take a mile. Let's try to make incremental um, action and improvements so that we can take an inch every year. And so maybe it's like 1%, maybe the goal for a, a company with 401k match is to offer up to 5% after five years. And so it's 1% every year. How can financially, how can that make sense? And not everyone in, invests in 401k. Same with not everyone is going to um, have a family, whether through birthing or adoption or, or what have you. So offering something, even if it is more time off, um, could be more beneficial than, you know, especially f- to your point when it comes to recruiting compared to an organization that offers nothing. And I think I, I recently or recently, you know, time in my mind works in a very funny way. So recently is a loose term. Um, but recently enough, I talked about um, kind of just the the realities of where workplaces are with um, benefits and maternity leaves and leaves in general Um, and I think this kind of came out, I don't know if you're aware of the skim and what their campaign that they had around parental leave. I think this must have been, I don't know, four to six months ago or so that they did this campaign, um, called the show us your leave campaign. And it was so, um, effective. Basically what they did was they called on companies to talk about the leaves that they offer, um, from a maternity paternity standpoint. And some companies were so embarrassed that they actually ended up changing their leaves because they were not willing to post what their existing leave was until they enhanced it, which is really kind of what the mode uh, and the method, or I should say the goal of that Show Us Your Leave campaign was not only to highlight companies that were doing a great job in offering leave benefits, but also to encourage those that weren't doing such a great job to do better. And so there were tons of companies who... Um, thought they were doing a really great job with offering like eight weeks of paid leave, for example, which is not doing a great job. It's kind of, to me, if you ask, it's doing the bare minimum because if someone is a birthing parent, it's, you know, even with a cesarean section, it's an eight week recovery. So, you know, that's, that's about that. Right. So um, most people might not be aware of this unless they, again, have been in a position where they've needed to take advantage of a leave benefit or have seen someone maybe in their close circle to take advantage of a leave benefit. So I share all of this because obviously adoption, and maybe not so obviously for those listening, adoption does qualify under FMLA um, for parental leaves. And so when we think about bonding time, when we think about that time and, and, and needed to care for and really, again, yeah, bond with a child, whether through birth or adoption, that time is really valuable. But on top of that, if a business does not offer the pay portion or someone doesn't live in a state where the pay portion is then running concurrent with the unpaid time, it makes it very hard for someone to reasonably take that time. And so this is where that Show Us Your Leave campaign really did an amazing job of encouraging companies to really think differently about their paid leave options. So I think there's probably a ton of work still to do. I know there are companies out there that friends work for that don't offer anything. Um, And so you kind of just have to hope and pray that you live in New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, California, or some other part of the U.S. that offers paid leave, Massachusetts. So, um, you know, this this, uh, uh, monologue here is to share that adoption benefits obviously do qualify for FMLA. Um, And then I I kind of would love to follow up on a question here as far as, you know, because I know you said that eight weeks is typically what you're seeing with businesses offering these adoption benefits time to bond. Um, Are there companies that are kind of like the North Star for benefits that maybe do have tons of resources that we should all aspire to be able to provide to folks? 
The growth of any business relies on the workforce behind it, and Namely knows that if you can wow your people, you can power your business. Namely is the all-in-one HR solution that empowers you to engage and develop your people in an intuitive platform, so you can make your life easier and your employees happier. Namely's award-winning technology gives your employees the career and connections they need to truly become part of your business. Whether you have 20 or 1,000 employees, Namely handles the essential HR, payroll, and compliance needs all through their modern and integrated platform. With Namely, your team stays engaged with a seamless interface and self-service tools to request PTO, acknowledge peers, review pay stubs, and enroll in benefits, while you get the time and data you need to focus on your core business initiatives. As Namely helps you easily handle Handle everything from onboarding, payroll, time tracking, open enrollment, employee engagement, and so much more. Make your life easier and power your business with Namely today. Learn how you can simplify your HR processes today at Namely.com. That's Namely.com. If your company is remote or hybrid, then you know just how difficult it can be to grow your company's culture beyond a pre-scheduled Zoom happy hour or occasional lunch and learn. Well, this week's sponsor is here to solve that. They're called CultureBot. CultureBot has devised what will likely become the gold standard for growing and blossoming a company culture inside of Slack. The app is like a sidekick for any HR or people professional, automating a lot of the mundane tasks you probably are forgetting to do on a daily basis. Things like birthday and work anniversary celebrations, team shout outs and kudos, employee introductions, and remote games. It even has health and wellness tips and conversation starters. If that piques your interest, this will get you even more excited. Today, I'm able to share a special promotion for listeners of the podcast. You can get your first six months of CultureBot for 50% off. Plus, if your team is under 25 employees, CultureBot is free forever. So if you're looking for a way to create a culture of appreciation and drive increased engagement and togetherness across your team, I definitely recommend checking out CultureBot. Go to getculturebot.com slash humanhr. That's getculturebot.com slash humanhr to get the offer. Plus, I've added the link in the show notes, so you can just click right there. Now, let's get back to the podcast. There are, and, and again, the top um, on, on our 100 Best Adoption Friendly Workplace list this past year, Farring Pharmaceuticals was number one. They offer, again, unlimited financial reins- reimbursement wow. and 26 weeks of paid leave. Um, wow. And that's over and above the FMLA requirement. So, yeah. Um, you know, there there are those that do recognize that in order to keep um, quality employees who are going through again what it what is embedded into the fabric of this country that we need to recognize that <clears throat> excuse me and we need to support it. Now, not every company can do that. Understood, and and particularly smaller organizations where you can't afford to to lose someone for twenty six weeks, but you right. can certainly do do better than perhaps you can stretch a bit um, uh, where it's offering. Uh, what what's already offered. I think something else to keep in mind, at least for the adoption benefit conversation, is it opens up a platform as well for a business to do those soft kinds of things, um, to make sure that employees understand that there are top adoption tax credits for many of their employees post-adoption um, and how to get access to those. And many states have them as well. Um, that there are ways to um, do internal kinds of education and brown bag lunches and resource um, fairs on this notion of adoption and get get employees connected or get internally those families who have adopted who might not otherwise talk to each other or under, or know get those folks together so that they can share their experiences so it it opens up a, another door to those soft employee engagement kind of activities that an employer may not have thought of private previously as well right right yeah that makes total sense and I'm curious, is there a percentage of American or North American households that tend to adopt or lean into foster care? Do you, is, are there statistics on that? There are. We know that about temper. We do a survey every few years of of Americans' attitudes toward adoption and ask a lot of questions, um, uh, and uh, through Harris uh, poll. And we know that about 10% of our respondents have um, have adopted or were adopted, and about 37% of our respondents have a connection to adoption. So either they know someone, they, they have a friend, they have a, a family member who has either adopted or was adopted. So significant, and again, that number goes up and down when we when we collect it. But I think that's uh, that's fairly representative of of uh, the American public. So again, a large majority, and I think as we continue this this culture continues to realize that a lot of single parents now 
uh, are deciding that, that, you know what, um, I'm going to stay single, I'm going to adopt, or there mm-hmm. are same-sex unions that adopt. There are grandparents raising grandchildren, a significant number of grandparents raising grandchildren. Yeah. Some of those move toward legal permanency in one way, either legal guardianship or legal adoption. So that notion of adoption is a lot different now than it was 50 years ago. And so more and more uh, there's there's just a, a different variety of of what a, an adoptive family looks like than the typical um, you know heterosexual two person family that's adopting an infant. Absolutely, absolutely, and this is this is actually precisely where these benefits become equitable because if someone is in a same sex uh, relationship, there there are two ways really to be able to well maybe three ways to be able to have a child. There's surrogacy. There's uh, IVF if one of the if the partners are, are women um, and then there's adoption and maybe there's some other uh, medical uh, options out there that I'm unaware of but uh, you know you are those are costly benefits those are or, or costly options I should say and when companies do offer benefits that are comprehensive you are creating an equitable environment for all of the relationship types that you have in your company. And this point on uh, single people who are choosing to adopt, I recently uh, was watching this show, Love is Blind, and this is like a show that's been taking the world by storm. It's like on its fourth season. And actually, we're recording this a day after the reunion, and it's totally irrelevant. But for many of my listeners, considering uh, many are Gen Z and millennial, they're probably going to be like, I remember the reunion. Anyway, I bring this up because on one of the episodes, I took note of this in my mind because I'm just constantly thinking about HR and different things like this. One of the cast members, let's say, um, talked about how if she didn't find love in this show and she didn't end up in a marriage or engagement, that she was considering just adopting on her own. And that, you know, and she shared that many people that she's spoken with who are single in their 30s or 40s decide, well, I don't want to wait to find a partner. I want to have a child and I'm just going to adopt. So it's really true that the, you know, like stereotypical um, family dynamic that maybe our, our families or our parents grew to know or understand is different today. And that adoption is not uh, something to just fit into a box from the 1950s, but actually something that's um, can really be widely uh, afforded by so many people who do choose to want to expand their own family unit in however way they want. So I think that was, uh, that's just a pop culture reference <laughs> for the day. But um, I thought that was really interesting because I, I guess being married and being in a heterosexual relationship myself, like I just didn't think about that. I just never thought about that. And I thought it was really interesting to think about adoption in a different way, especially leading up to our conversation today. Exactly. I mean, adoption is a dynamic force, I think, in this country. And and for so many children, it leads to, for them, a sense of permanency, a sense of justice in their lives, that they're not lingering, waiting. And, you know, if you look at a global scale, it's, 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 it's it can be a little bit overwhelming thinking about the need that exists for children and adoption. But mm-hmm. um, certainly that, that reciprocal need, a, a parent wanting to parent and a child needing a, a home, um, it's it's just a, an incredible force that's at work in this country right now. Yes, I just got the chills when you said that because it really is simply that. Uh, it's a symbiotic relationship in the sense that if there is a parent who wants to parent and obviously children need a safe place to call home, that that is such a wonderful way to um, have two wonderful outcomes from one decision. Um, and I guess just because I, I'm not aware, is there a percentage of American children who are in the foster care system or and or are being put up for adoption um, each yeah. year? Is it climbing? Yeah. Is it stagnant? It's, it's a great question, and it goes through cycles. Um, it's been, so right now, as we're talking, there are about 440,000 children who are in some sort of substitute foster care arrangement in this country. Wow. And again, these are children who are there through no fault of their own. They've been abused, neglected, abandoned. Of those children, about 117,000 in the United States, um, the abuse has been so egregious, and the family has been unable um, to 
be made safe for this child. Look, make no mistake, every child deserves to be in their family of origin. That's what we want. And we don't want them right. coming into the foster care system. So we need to support families as best we can. If that doesn't happen, they move into the foster care system and that family can't be fixed for lack of a better phrase. Then those a judge legally and permanently separates that child from that family, terminates all parental rights. And those children, 117,000 of them right now in this country, are waiting to be adopted. And the average age of a child waiting to be adopted is about eight years old. But the next statistic is the statistic that drives all of the programs here at the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, or at least most of them. About 20,000 of those children every year turn 18 and leave the foster care system without a family. We failed in our promise to them that we will find a family for you. And we know what happens to those kids, not because they're bad kids, but because they don't have the safety net of a family, because they don't have that constant role modeling and, and, and learning and, and all of that natural stuff that happens within a secure family environment. They're at a much higher risk of homelessness, of being undereducated, unemployed, reinvolvement in systems, of becoming early parents themselves. So our job here and, and in communities is to make sure that one, we support families so that they don't have to move into systems like the foster care system. But when they do, we continue to support those families and give them every resource possible to get their kids back home where kids want to be. They don't want to leave their families, no matter what the circumstances are. Yeah. But when they finally are legally separated, then we have to make every effort to get them an adoptive family and make sure that all of those supports necessary to deal with the trauma and the grief and the loss that that child has experienced is supported in their new adoptive family. That is tough. Like all of those numbers are really tough pills to swallow. And I mean, uh, it really makes me grateful for the environment and the family that I grew up in um, because, you know, it's, it, it's the one thing that is so easy to take for granted, but the one thing that also now I understand 500,000 kids are not necessarily afforded the, 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 access to, um, through just the, you know, families of their families of origin. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, I, I hope that everyone's reflecting on this. I'm sure that I have listeners who have been adopted or considered adopting or have uh, a connection to adoption or foster care themselves. And maybe this is, uh, something that they have already thought about or that they're already aware of, but, um, for for anyone that's maybe like me and it did not have this information, I think it's really important. Um, and just thinking about, I mean, we, we've we seen the movies, we've seen the TV shows about those kids who turn 18 and then ha don't have those roots, don't have those, uh, those family connections. It is true that then, you know, society uh, becomes that much more difficult for them to adopt to um, and become a part of um, in a way that, maybe is easier for those who are um, with their families or not neglected or abused. And, and you know, it's easier for us um, in some ways because we've, we've just naturally been given the privilege of having a safe home, um, exactly. hopefully. Although I'm sure that there are children out there who have not been separated from their families who don't necessarily have that privilege either. Um, I mean, not to bring in the government into this conversation, but I think one of my thoughts is that, you know, the government, rightfully so, separates children when they are in neglectful or abusing, uh, abused situations. Um, but it sounds like there's an opportunity to close the loop in how children or young adults who then move out of the foster care system, who potentially have not been adopted, how they are then looked after. Because it's in society's best interest to ensure that those individuals have some uh, launching pad or some resource available so that they become productive members of society and feel connected to something. Um, because that, that lack of connection, whether you are in your family of origin or not, it's when you don't have a connection, uh, it's, it can present really sometimes dangerous outcomes for individuals. So, um, yeah, it sounds, I mean, I know that there are many states that do a great job in how they, protect children or options that they have for families, whether it's financial assistance or otherwise, but it does sound like there are some other resources that we can provide those who um, do not have safe homes or, or families to go to. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's an example. Many states offer educational waivers to, to children who age out of foster care, who turn 18 and, and leave foster care without a family. And that's great. So it can get them into a, a state college. But what happens when the college closes down at holiday breaks, uh, at summer break? They've lost their housing and they, again, they're on the street. And so a lot of universities are starting to recognize that and putting in place those kind of ongoing supports for kids if they self-identify that they've been mm -hmm. in foster care or that they don't have a home to go to during spring break. Um, they provide that kind of housing. So you're right. There's, there's just this constant need for recognizing um, those less fortunate among us and how do we gracefully and respectfully support them so that they can feel empowered to continue to grow and thrive. Right. And then it, it, I guess on the other side of things too, it's like, how do we support individuals to make better decisions when they do decide to have a family so that they are caring for the children that they bring into the world? Um, or if they are for whatever reason, unable to care for their children, that there are other options that they don't have to, you know, that maybe adoption is better, um, rather than, bringing up a child in a home that then they're just going to be separated from. Um, all of this sounds like educational opportunities. And, and I would imagine, I mean, I, I grew up in a, a, a town that was pretty diverse socioeconomically, but also racially. Um, and then I personally grew up in a lower middle class home. And so I know that there are, of course, resources for families, but I also know that um, in many cases, those who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds tend to have more challenges when it comes to uh, family decisions or even um, being able to care for children. Because I know that there are also situations where, although this is not personal to me, I, I'm, I have known people who, whose parents just couldn't take care of them. And it wasn't necessarily uh, you know, a, a lack of compassion or care, but that they just physically couldn't do it. Um, and it's devastating. But the reality is, is that I, I, I think, and I would love to hear from you since you're the expert here, if there is um, a connection to those who enter foster care or are put up for adoption, at least domestically, if there's a connection to socioeconomic status, and if there, you know, if there's all of these things kind of present to me how society can do a better job of affording children opportunities to safe home environments just through improving the economy and improving access to resources and programs for people to have jobs and be able to provide for their families. So is there a connection there? There absolutely is. So that, that connection between poverty and neglect is profound. Um, and again, it doesn't mean that this isn't a family that doesn't want to adequately care for their child. They simply can't. And so what we saw during the pandemic as just a small example is when the um, child tax credit was expanded during the pandemic, right, right, to support families. We saw a significant reduction, not only in poverty, but a significant reduction in kids moving into foster care as a result of all of the issues that surround that. And, and it's, it's usually neglect. Don't have enough food, don't have a warm home, don't have, can't get to school, all of those kinds of, of things that should be in place for a safe child. We saw right. a significant reduction. We haven't been able to keep that in place. And so I think it's that kind of um, um, government uh, advocacy that we need to make sure that we're not just giving a hand out, we're helping right. a family avoid significantly negative, long-term negative consequences. And for the community, long-term economic consequences, if we just really look at how do we help this family stay together? How do we help support right. this family? So there's lots of other examples like that, but absolutely, there is a line, a direct link between um, frequently between poverty and a movement into the foster care system that could be um, uh, stopped fairly quickly. Right. Yeah, this is all so fascinating and interesting. And I think it just goes to show how deeply benefits impact society. Because when someone is able to, let's say, work for a company that, that has an adoption benefit, maybe even not something like uh, your number one company that offers 100% uh, compensation, which is amazing. I think everyone listening is probably going to their job board to see what jobs they have avail available after they listen to this episode. <laughs> um, but you know, even a company that maybe offers eight weeks pay and maybe some other compensation or, or other benefits, how that trickles down, there's such a, um, 
it's like a butterfly effect. I don't know if you've ever watched that movie or if you're familiar with the term, but this idea that one thing impacts another, which impacts another, which impacts another. And so some, if someone is able to take advantage of a benefit, there, it would be so interesting to understand the costs and the savings associated just long term for a city, for a state, when one person is able to take advantage of a benefit offered by one company and how you exactly. exponentially Im- improve that that number when you ha- when more companies offer those benefits. So, you know, I like to, as an HR pr- practitioner, I like to think beyond the four walls of the company. Like, how does how does a, a maternity or paternity leave benefit impact the bigger picture? And the bigger picture isn't just the company. The bigger picture is the society in which this person lives and and thrives, hopefully, and contributes to. So, it's just really interesting to be able to think through this, you know, concept of offering adoption benefits. And then it's, it's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. And then beneath the surface, it's this understanding that there are uh, societal and economic uh, benefits when something like this happens. There's a potentially a relief for a family that is unable to take care of their, of their child and the stress that's probably associated with that. And then knowing that their child is not going to go through the foster care system, but rather has an adoptive family that cares for their child. Um, so I can just only imagine the reverberation through society that this type of benefit could offer. Exactly. It's it's a classic win-win-win situation. It's a win for the employer. It's a win for the family, of course, and it's a win for the community at large um, to, to have these kind of things in place. And you're right, something as relatively simple as an elevated uh, financial assistance for an adoptive family or, or paid leave a recognition that this family is a viable and, and thriving family that, that could benefit from these this assistance um, goes a long, 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 and probably lifelong and, and perhaps, you know, um, um, legacy long way toward helping both families and, and the community at large. Absolutely. And uh, while we're coming up on our time here, I did want to make mention of a few awareness months here. So April is Child Abuse Awareness Month. May is Foster Care Awareness Month, and then November is National Adoption Awareness Month. So depending on when this episode comes out, it will be in one of these months to uh, recognize, you know, the the awareness that uh, should be had around these subjects. And, um, you know, just in general, hopefully the listeners have taken or are walking away from this episode with a ton of new information, um, hopefully some, some uh some passion and inspiration for how they can go back to their companies, especially when we think about, you know, coming up on a new year. This is kind of around the time when people will start, will start to think about, okay, how can we enhance our benefits? Do we send out a benefit survey? How can we include adoption and fostering benefits in the survey so someone has the opportunity to express what they're looking for or what they would be interested in. So for those listening, every single person here has an impact uh, or an opportunity to impact their company and their company's offerings. And Rita, thank you so much for uh, the the wealth of knowledge and your expertise that you've um, shared with all of us today. I'm, I'm walking away really humbled, really grateful for the things that I've been given in life. Um, and just, you know, again, with a, a heightened awareness of how difficult life can really be for some people and how companies, foundations like the Dave Thomas Foundation and even city and state governments, how much of an impact they can have on uh, the future of children and, and families. Oh, we're just grateful to have Ben on your show today. Thank you for that. And uh, again, if anybody wants any more information about ad- adoption friendly workplace, easily found on our website, davethomasfoundation.org. Amazing. And you can connect with Rita too on LinkedIn. We'll have everything linked in, uh, linked in the show notes uh, so that you can easily connect with Rita, check out the Dave Thomas Foundation. And I'm going to look for some uh, additional resources so folks can better understand maybe some, uh, some other options. Uh, of course, it's going to really be tied back to the Dave Thomas Foundation website because that's really where all of those resources live. But check out the show notes, everyone, for those of you listening so that you can get connected and, and learn more. Rita, thank you so much for your time and um, I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you. 
Hey, just before you go, don't forget to subscribe to the show so that you are the first to hear when an episode drops each week. And maybe leave a five-star review and a comment about how much you loved this episode. Plus, if you have someone in mind who would really enjoy this episode, make sure you share it with them. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next week.